this into the following sections. What is the news? News values, three case studies, The Sun, Independent, The Western Telegraph. And lastly, is the press out of control? So, what is the news? News is the reporting of carefully selected events considered by news institutions as important or interesting. The audience for news can be local, regional, national or international. News can take many different forms. Amongst the most common are television, radio, press, the internet. So, what have we got? Right. Hmm. Bang em up. Mum urges MPs to back Blair on terror law. Right. Victory for terror. So, what have we considered as news changes over time? But what hasn't changed is that the event must be considered newsworthy. News has turned into a commodity that can be bought and sold like anything else. Bearing this in mind, news is like any other media output, carefully constructed from a particular viewpoint. Although, what institutions select as news has changed over the years, the underlying principles of what to select and the presentation of news is more constant. These principles are generally referred to as news values. These include the following. Personalisation. Fisk suggested that familiarity was one of the major keys to a successful story. As an audience, we need to be able to identify directly with someone involved in the story. Our allegiance appears to be with celebrities or characters we can relate to. When Robert Maxwell died, around 6,000 people were killed in a typhoon in the Philippines. But Robert Maxwell was still the first item on the BBC's 9 o'clock news. Political coverage is often reported in terms of personalities. Think about the election between Tony Blair and Michael Howard. Tony Blair was characterised as Tony Blair and Michael Howard as Dracula. The horror of an earthquake is suddenly made more real if a paper reports the story from the view of a child or parent. This method has been criticised because the impact of the story appears to be more important than finding out what the cause or real issues are. Negativity. The worse the tragedy, the more catastrophic, the more likely it would be a headline in the papers. Bad news is favoured over good news. Hard news. This is serious or important events such as war, terrorism, political or economic crisis. Soft news. These are features that contain information on entertainment. For example, in the Daily Express, we've got Just Wild About Harry. 7,000 fans turn out in rain for Potter Premier. Also, consumer information or human interest stories. Visual imperatives. Powerful representations reinforce the news item but sometimes are distorted by technology. For example, we have a powerful photo with Tony Blair on the side, which really reinforces the message. OK, we're very, very fortunate to have Debbie James, a freelance journalist working mainly in newspapers, magazines and radio for nearly 20 years. Thank you very much for joining us, Debbie, Thank today. You. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin with a question first of all. Do you think that the British press is out of control? Well, that's a very interesting question. I think there are certain sectors of the British press which are out of control, but you also have some very responsible sectors of the media. Um, for instance, the BBC, a very responsible public service broadcaster. They're largely to inform the public and respected throughout the world for that. But then you also have what we all know as the tabloids, which um, cover more scurrilous stories, stories which people might argue aren't in the public interest. 
but then the celebrities use these newspapers um, in a way to promote themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, if there's a new film that they want to promote, they're very happy. We've got an example here, the Sun newspaper today. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a photograph there of the, the actor who plays Harry Potter, very happy to have his photograph there on the front page today, but maybe next week there might be a photograph of him leaving a drug rehabilitation clinic. You know, <laughs> would would that be in the public interest? That would right. be an argument that, you know, the celebrity would put forward. Um, yes. Last week as well, we had an example of the editor of that newspaper, The Sun, Rebecca Wade, involved with a fracas with her husband. <laughs> and um, all of a sudden, the tables are turned, and it makes a very, very small piece on the front of that paper. Yes, you know, exactly, because we always see that um, celebrities are really eager to have their faces in the press to promote themselves as being the limelight. But then, as you say, if something bad happens, then they're not so eager to be seen. Are they? So they have to accept that what they are, then they have to take on board other things that come I along with it. Th th there are instances when that line is crossed and there is press intrusion. In Britain, the press is regulated by the Press Complaints Commission. 99% um, of newspapers, magazines and television companies sign up to this um, and abide by a code of conduct, which was tightened up, interestingly, after the death of Princess Diana. Mm -hmm. um, the identity and the, um, the privacy of children is now more heavy, heavily regulated and protected. Um, long, long lens photography is banned. And basically, that does seem to work. It's and it, we're able to maintain a free press Brilliant. because of that. Well, Debbie, we've talked about celebs. Now, what is your views on uh, the Tony Martin incident? Is that not a bit outrageous? I mean, he made a lot of money out of crime here. So what are your well, views yes. on that? Here we have Tony Martin, a farmer who lay in wait in his isolated farmhouse. He'd been burgled several times, lay in wait with a shotgun and shot a 16-year-old burglar in the back. Um, he was convicted of manslaughter. He went to prison for his crime. While he was in prison, there was a campaign to release him by people who felt that he was just protecting his property. Right. So when he came out of prison, the Daily Mirror paid him £100,000 for his story. And the argument um, to justify that, that that story was in the public interest was the fact how far can a householder go to defend their to property. Defend, yeah. There are other incidents, such as uh, Mary Bell. The author made a lot of money out of that incident, didn't she? Yes, the author Gita Sereni paid Mary Bell for her story. There was quite a lot of repulsion um, on that issue. Um, here we have a child, child killer profiting from her crime. And yet that was argued that it was in the public interest because she committed that crime when she was a juvenile. Mm -hmm. And here, many years later, she's telling her story. But that actually backfired as far as Mary, Mary Bell was concerned right. because she ended up with having the press on her doorstep. She'd started a new life, new identity. But then she was discovered by the press and all that of course, was flown. Yeah. Well, Debbie, we've covered national newspapers. Now, what are your views on regional press? Well, I think the regional press is largely responsible. You know, the stories that they cover, we've got an example here, um, a newspaper which um, circulates in the county of Pembrokeshire. For instance, campaigns are a large part of um, the stories that are published in this type of newspaper. Mm -hmm. There's an ongoing issue with health services in Pembrokeshire, so the local papers launched a campaign to save the local hospital. And the community get on board, they get involved by um, asking, they're asked to sign a form and send that off to their local MP. Mm -hmm. And that, that really does have an impact, uh -huh. you know, but by involving the community, there have been results. Brilliant. But also there are stories that upset um, people. You know, I said earlier on that they're largely responsible, but occasionally, for instance, there's a story on, on the same front page about yes. a, a male doctor at this very hospital who's decided to come out as a transsexual, mm -hmm. a, a cross-dresser. And there were many people who were very repulsed by that story. They felt that it didn't have a place on the front of a family local newspaper. Right. You know, comments that I heard was, you know, they'd buy the sun if they wanted that type of story, whereas the local paper is there to inform them of course. of events and things that are happening. Definitely. Now, can we talk a little bit about advertising, Debbie? 
the Western Telegraph, for example, 80% of its revenue is based on advertising. Now, what is the influence on the editorial team? I think that advertising in some respects has an influence on the editorial policy. For instance, um, a car company who might advertise weekly, perhaps there's um, a competition that they're offering a car as a prize in, so they would ask the editorial team to send along a photographer, um, the prize being presented by a, a local celebrity. And so yes, that would make its way onto the pages of a newspaper, but if the director of that car company ended up in court for speeding or for a far worse crime, then that story would be used in that newspaper as much as anyone else's story would be used because I feel that if um, the editorial policy is, be, is, is compromised in that way, then the confidence of the readership would be lost. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Debbie. We've covered a lot of topics from regional to national papers, and I'm sure this will help the students immensely. Thank you very much. <laughs> to explore the use of news values, we're going to look at the following case studies. The Sun, the Independent and the Western Telegraph. The Sun is a national tabloid or red top owned by News International, a subsidiary of News Corporation. Its editor is Rebecca Wade, but ultimately the ideological standpoint is controlled by Rupert Murdoch, the owner. Politically, the Sun did support the Conservatives, but after the 1997 elections began supporting Labour. Although the Sun supports Labour, Murdoch appears to change his political standpoint depending on market trends and commercial interests. This is well documented in his other business activities. From its demographic profile, it is mostly read by men and its readership is fairly evenly spread across the 15 to 44 age group and slightly less readership for the 44 to 65 age group and interestingly, mostly bought by the middle classes. At 30p on weekdays and 50p on the weekends, it is at the cheaper end of the market with 33% of the paper dedicated to advertising. The story we are going to focus on and compare is the proposed anti-terrorist legislation which would enable suspected terrorists to be held by police for up to 90 days without charging them. Let's look at the layout of the sun first. Over half of the page is taken up by this story mostly headline with the story continuing on pages 8 and 9. The rest of the page is taken up with soft news as opposed to the story we are focusing on, which is hard news. The use of the soft news, mostly the premiere of the new Harry Potter film, acts as a direct contrast to the serious issue of terrorism. It softens the blow with a humorous strap line, What the frock you got on, Harry? The political story headline is characteristic of the sun, direct in simple terms. Bang em up. The picture supporting the story is small. An older woman looking directly at us. Although a small picture, the meaning is clear. She doesn't look like a victim. She looks assertive and the sentiments of the paper are clear. Back tough new laws to hold terror suspects. The use of 7-7 is reminiscent of 9-11 and the Twin Towers incident perhaps signifying that this is only one attack of many more to come that need harsh measures to deal with them. The language used is very emotive and reactionary. Let's have a quick listen to this. The mother of a 7-7 victim last night urged MPs to back tough new laws to hold terror suspects for up to 90 days. The headline talks about banging M up. The use of M or them signifying there could be an army of terrorists ready to attack without the police being able to cope. The inside headline reinforces the sentiments on the first page with a stronger retributive headline, Victory for Terror. Terror stands out in red signifying blood and death and ties in well with a photo of the red London bus from the July bombing. The inside article is split into two. The main article and underneath it, the list of shame, the MPs who voted against the 90-day proposal. 
we have the constant use of personalization throughout the article. A mother lost her daughter, a man who lost his girlfriend, a picture of the daughter smiling, which is incongruous with the other images connected to the story. The reporting is not objective, but opinionated and uses language that promotes fear. The image of Tony Blair has carefully been chosen. His body language is serious, leaning forward, caught looking as if he is putting his case. The inclusion of the poppy on his lapel, reminding us of war and the war we are engaged in now. The war on terrorism. The Independent is a national paper. In contrast to The Sun, it is not controlled by a larger organisation. It is, as the name suggests, owned by an independent company, Independent News and Media PLC. The paper was launched in 1986 with a campaign which used the phrase, it is, are you, meaning independent. This drew attention to the fact that there isn't a corporate owner such as Murdoch and News International. The independence editorial policy is one of neutrality and this can be clearly seen when we come to comparing terror legislation reported in both the Sun and Independent. It has survived the price war initiated by Murdoch in 1993, which affected the independence figures badly. However, it is still here and offering choice and attempting to provide unbiased reporting. From its demographic profile, it is mostly read by men and its readership is mostly between the 45 to 54 age group. At 65p on weekdays and £1.10p on Saturday, it's at the more expensive end of the market, with 25% of the paper dedicated to advertising. Before you look at the terror legislation story, something immediately hits you at the front of the independent. Let's have a look. This has a wider view on issues. It has a very European feel, especially when compared to the Sun, which has a very British feel. Reporting on the front page only on British issues. The Independent, on the other hand, has riots in France as the main story, taking up the whole of the page. So this gives the paper more of a European feel. The language is more sophisticated, and rather than just one headline with one message, we have a selection of issues or questions raised for debate in France. Immediately, the reader is engaged in an active debate, rather than reacting to emotive language. The story on terror legislation is not a leading story, but is on page six. The headline reads, Blair faces angry rebel MPs with an offer of terror bill compromise. This appears to report without the emotive comments of the son. Here, we don't have personalization like the son, where a mother tells us what she would do. We have instead what appear to be the facts. The language isn't confrontational like the son. For example, both papers refer to a Sky News poll. The Sun states that 72% of voters want the legislation changes. The Independent says the same thing, but uses the word supported instead of want. The use of supported is less confrontational. Only one picture is used for the story, a close-up of Charles Clark, the Home Secretary. Unlike the Sun, which has a picture of the bombed bus from July the 7th. We have no sensational representation from the Independent and no obvious political agenda for the paper. The Western Telegraph. This is an example of a local paper. The Western Telegraph was published first in 1854 and is now owned by the NewsQuest Group, which itself is owned by a large American media company, American Garnet. It geographically covers the whole of Pembrokeshire, Carmarthenshire and parts of Ceredigion, collectively known as West Wales. Rather than being daily like the Sun and the Independent, the Western Telegraph is published on a weekly basis. It has a weekly circulation of 27,411 and it self-estimates that on average two people read each copy. Demographically, unlike the other two national papers, it's predominantly read by females rather than males. The readership runs across all age groups, although the largest age group is the 25 to 35s. OK, here we are, the front page of the Western Telegraph. The first difference that we can see 
is the overall news values here are generally not negative, but positive. We have a very busy front page with editorial and advertising. The image at the top of the paper depicts three little girls dressed like witches for Halloween, with a heading, Be Witching. The caption tells us that the picture was taken at Busy Bee's nursery, so this will appeal to all the parents and relatives of those who attended this nursery. The image has been carefully selected to appeal just to the community and is a typical technique used in selecting pictures and stories in regional papers. At the top of the page, this sentiment is reinforced by the strap line, the newspaper that fights for Pembrokeshire. The representation suggested is that this is the local community's paper. OK, so let's look at the main story. Councillor hit by card cloners. Christmas shoppers from Pembrokeshire could become victims of cash point criminals and have thousands of pounds stolen from their bank accounts. The first difference between this story and a national paper is that it is retrospective. We are told about an incident that happened last week. In fact, the story is less of a story and more of a public information article. Be careful when getting money out of a cash machine because of card cloners. Because the paper is published once every week, the paper has to make sure that the story will last for the whole week and not be too topical. Unlike the two national papers, the bottom band tells the reader immediately the number to call to advertise and ring to give a story. This regional paper, like most others, relies on advertising to sustain it. In fact, 80% of the paper is advertising. This compares to 25% for the independent and 33% for the sun. Public safety is high on the agenda for this paper. Look at page 3 a whole page dedicated to telling the reader the dangers of fireworks and the best thing to do to avoid injury. Another feature of regional papers that differs from national press is the marrying up of editorial with advertising. Sometimes it is difficult to tell which is which, since good editorial or press about a product is one of the most effective forms of advertising. For example, we have a page here dedicated to the local Pembrokeshire College. We have both advertising and editorial. The editorial, as we can see here, is dedicated to giving us success stories and telling us the positive side of attending Pembrokeshire College. We ask ourselves, is the representation we have here correct? Is this balanced reporting? Well, the answer must be no. But rather than an ideological standpoint, which has a political bias like the sun, this appears to have a bias towards the positive side of the advertiser. Pembrokeshire College is a big advertiser and as such is unlikely to get bad press from the Western Telegraph as it is a major source of revenue. Smiling faces are a visual feature for a regional paper which differ from the negative images in the sun. Features are another difference between regional and national papers these give a small bit of editorial, but are really just a vehicle for advertising. Look at this page. Restaurant of the Year. Regional papers have some of the same sections as a national newspaper, although every piece of news will have a local slant. So some of the same codes and conventions are used. We even have the sports section at the back of the paper which is where it's positioned in both our two national papers. But in the regional paper, it's all about the local hero. So the differences are geographic distribution. Any national news is given local slant. Demographic readership, non-topical stories that last the week. Ratio of editorial to advertising much larger. Public safety announcements, positive representations rather than negative editorial advertising, features used as vehicles for advertising. The similarities are similar layout, main story on the front, sports in the back. All contain some emotive stories but not sensationalised as in Sun. All rely on advertising as part of their revenue. All have editorial which is disguise advertising. An example can be seen in the independent article about the return of Noel Edmonds to our screens. This is really more of a press release, which in essence is a form of advertising. All inform on public safety. 
A lot of regional papers are owned by large media organisations who have homogenised the house styles and bought small independent companies to get rid of competition. Is the press out of control? Is the press running riot? Can they print anything they want? In Britain, we have a free press which is generally self-regulated, but it doesn't seem to stop the most shocking stories sometimes being printed. After the death of Princess Diana, her brother stated that all the owners and editors of every newspaper who paid for pictures of her had blood on their hands. The press always claim they're reporting in the public interest. We live in a democratic society, so a free press is an essential freedom. Although mainly self-regulating, we do have some protective legislation. Firstly, the Official Secrets Act 1911. This is updated in 1988 and prohibits the media disclosing information about the security services, defence and the conduct of international relations. In fact, editors can be served with D-notices, which prevents publication on matters of national security. The Act has been criticised as it allows government to avoid accountability for their actions. What about moral standards? These are protected by the Obscene Publications Act. This was passed to uphold standards of taste and decency and prosecute those who provided content thought to deprave and corrupt audiences. Of course, the problem is that this is very ambiguous and there is no clear definition what this includes, or indeed how it will affect the audience. To protect individuals from newspapers writing articles to damage their character, we have libel and defamation laws. These can be used by individuals and organisations to sue newspapers that damage their character. But many cases don't even reach court. When they do, it can be a costly business. A recent case awarded Rupert Lowe, the chairman of Southampton Football Club, a quarter of a million pounds over a Time Sports page which referred to the way he shabbily disposed of his former manager. Just one adjective cost £250,000. Should libel and defamation apply to celebrities? After all, they put themselves in the spotlight in the first place. Some celebrities claim it's not the use of pictures they object to, but the way the pictures are used to create untrue stories. Kate Hudson made it clear through her lawyers that she wanted to correct the seriously false and misleading impression a magazine had created about her. The story suggested that Kate was suffering from an eating disorder, which she claimed she was not. As Edgar Forbes suggested in The Guardian, if a picture doesn't tell its own story, you need to be careful with the one you attach to it. Newspapers are regulated not by the government, but by the Press Complaints Commission, or PCC. This commission was set up in 1991. Its slogan is fast, fair and free, and it issues guidelines on acceptable behaviour when reporting. These guidelines were agreed by owners and editors in the industry. It covers those who are vulnerable, such as children, hospital patients, and those who are at risk from discrimination. The PCC dealt with 3,649 complaints in 2003. The Commission itself is made up of not just representatives of the press, but also representatives from the rest of society, such as public health, the church and legal profession. However, there is a kind of get-out clause for journalists. If the story is in the public interest, and this can be demonstrated and a full explanation given, then the story can be published. The PCC states that public interest includes Detecting or exposing crime or a serious misdemeanour. Protecting public health and safety. And preventing the public from being misled by some statement or action of an individual or organisation. In the case of children, editors must demonstrate an exceptional public interest to override the normally paramount interest of the child. The PCC in its code states that everyone is entitled to respect for his or her private and family life, home and correspondence. The problem is that the PCC also say under these points that a story can be published if it's in the public interest, even if it contravenes an individual's privacy. But to make matters more difficult, we now have the European Convention on Human Rights, 
which came into force in 2000. This protects privacy, but also gives the right of free speech. The most recent test case on privacy was the case involving photos taken at the wedding of Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta-Jones. In an article entitled Photo Finish, Dan Tench explained how the law on privacy had been clarified. There were three aspects to privacy laid down in this case. The court noted distress caused by invasive photos. Privacy rights are personal and not transferable as if commercial rights. Damages awarded would be moderate. Privacy law was compared to personal injury and as such should not attract high damages. And injunctions were considered to be the best action stopping distribution of the publication. If courts think that publishers flaunt the privacy laws because they don't think they will have to pay any large damages, the courts may award higher costs. So is the press out of control? Even though the press do have a lot of freedom, there are guidelines and laws in place to protect people. What's important is that the vulnerable are protected through the PCC, which is free. To take a case through the courts is very expensive and may get your face in the newspaper even more. Although political allegiances are very evident, we do have a variety of publications displaying a variety of viewpoints. So in the end, the choice of what you read as the audience is up to you.